All right. You heard that? That was a language that nobody speaks, only me. Oh, yo, yo, you see this? Shout out to my G's, NFE, Lord Aries, King Neptune, oh, look, look, King Neptune, Lord Aries, Donald Trump, Obama, and the Secret Service. The dynamic duo that they are, yo. Those those two gentlemen right there are freaking amazing. Those two gentlemen are awesome. Like I'm glad they include me in a lot of things that they do. Uh, they, they when I met Neptune, he had a fucking. He still has it, but the yo, he's just just the presence. When you when you when you don't when you compliment your presence with a great personality, I think that shit right there speaks so much volumes, man. Like. Personality is a fucking, personality is a fucking, uh, personality makes you millions, personality makes a stamp, personality, personality allows you to walk around with a cloak on, nobody will see you because you're invisible, because all they think of you, about you is how dope your personality is, so salute to them, salute to all my, my, my friends that just, you guys just stand out from the bunch, we all special man, yo we all special. Just got to find our lane. Uh, did I give an intro yet? I don't know if I ever gave an intro, so I'm going to give another one. Hey, yo, it's your boy, okay? Everything is all skrrr. Stop your shit. Uh, it's my last one for the night, I promise. Now I got to do all this editing. Hey, let me know how you like my beard. I'm trying to look unapproachable. If I'm doing a good job, just let me know. All right, so I wanted to get into... And this is gonna be a. This is gonna be a. I'm gonna be straight up and honest. Um, I wanted. To, I was watching uh the Comedy Store documentary uh on Showtime. I think it's on Showtime on demand, but I was watching it on Spectrum TV, so I was watching it through my phone. I've heard of uh, most of us have heard of Paulie Shore. Biodome, the cowboy movie, Paulie, yeah, man, he's like a fucking, he's like a brunette carrot top, in my opinion, <laughs> but Paulie Shore's mom was a woman named Mitzi Shore, Paulie Shore's dad was a guy named uh, Sandy Shore, or Sammy Shore, some shit like that, my bad, but, now, the mom Mitzi, in this documentary, which is it's really all a tribute to her. No matter what way you shape it, no matter what way you mold it, it's a tribute to her. She died, I think, last year or two years ago. She died. Um, she created a place where people can, where, where, where comedians, I'm sorry, not people, specific people, where comedians have a fucking home. Like, not only a home, but a gym. Not only a gym, but a, 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 a safe space. Not only a safe space, something to look forward to. Like, motivation. Like, yo, she created, she created, Mitzi Shore is a goddess, man. Like, after seeing this documentary, yo, Dave Chappelle. Uh, 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 Dave, uh, uh, Dave Letterman. Uh, 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 Joe Rogan. Uh, 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 fucking... Annie Letterman, Annie Letterman, uh, 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 oh my God, I can't, it's, it's just so many names, man, it's just so many names, fucking, the guy with the chin, Dave Leto, uh, yo, uh, uh, Leno, it, it's just so many names, man, like, the comedy store in California was the mecca for comedians, don't, like, in a sense, I know SOBs was like that. SOBs was like you. If you performed in SOBs, you were the shit. I've performed in SOBs like five times. That's great to put on my resume. I didn't re realize how much it would resonate until I saw something like this, though. 
Like, Johnny Carson, oh, he, he was in New York and then he left New York. He went to California. He, it was a, right around the time where the comedy store was open. So now comedians, who you were really dope, Carson would bring you up to his show. That's the equivalent of being on, like, that was TV. You're on TV. If you were dope, you told you were a dope comedian, you're TV. Like, the, 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 that's the dope of, the, like, back in the days, comedians and people and writers and actors, you get a sitcom. If you get a sitcom, you hit the nail on the head. You're on TV all night, every night, guarantee. You get a contract for 30-something episodes, 20-something episodes, half a mil, a million dollars, whatever it may be. That's it. You hit it big. You hit it big. Yo, the, the comedy store was like the, the, the scouting place. You did real good. You got scouted. They bring you up. You go to Carson after that. This, this whole podcast was influenced and, 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 and it happened only because of one person that resonated with me. Freddie Prince Sr. We all know Freddie Prince Jr. We all know the pretty boy. We all know... Yo, you see how that white, man, white that man looks? Freddie Prince Jr.? You see how white he looks, his complexion, the the shows we've seen him on. Shit, I've even looked at his interviews. Do you see his 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 dynamic, how he carries himself? Um, that man comes from a Puerto Rican and Hungarian father. His father was Puerto Rican and Hungarian. You heard me? Like from New York, like from the Bronx, if I'm not mistaken. He, Freddie Prince Jr. Unfortunately, didn't get to meet, didn't get to have time with his father, cause Freddie Prince Sr. blew his fucking brains out. Freddie Prince Sr. used to like to play Russian roulette with himself and with other people. This is all in the doc. This is all in that comedy store documentary I speak about. Like. I really, really recommend it to people, especially if you're an entertainer, man. If you're an entertainer, I really recommend it because this entertainment world is really, really dark, deadly. You'll get set up. You get Kevin Harted, fuck around your security, recording you while you fucking. You know what I mean? You, 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 you. Somebody put something in your drink. Your man gave you a bottle of water that had you feeling funny later. This all happens in the industry, man. And and when I when I saw this documentary and I saw Freddie Prince Sr., he tells a joke, you know, on Johnny Carson when he first came on. He says, um, I was always curious how my parents met. I got a Puerto Rican mom. I got a Hungarian dad. I got a fuck. They were both on the train trying to pickpocket each other. That is hilarious. You got a gypsy and a Puerto Rican. Of course they're trying to pickpocket each other. That's all gypsies and Puerto Ricans do. I love you. I'm only playing. I'm talking about the '80s, but yeah, it, it, comedy style. <laughs> like yo, it. He was great. He was great. Nineteen, he told that joke. Twenty-two, he killed himself. Three years took three years of all that pain that he had eternally going through, having all that success, money, and eligibility to do what you please without anybody trying to give you no direction or you trying to listen to it. Him killing himself, he's no longer here. Freddie Prince Jr. grows up without a dad. He's in the fucking documentary, too, as a little boy at the funeral. Fucking resignation, man. Mitzi Short, she got that fucking comedy club because instead of taking alimony from Sandy Short, I think his name was Sandy, fuck. Yeah, I think it was him. Instead of taking and, and instead of taking money, she said, "Just give me the comedy club." They bought a house with a comedy club attached. That comedy club was in all of the Warner Brothers. Uh, uh no, in the Walt Disney or Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers first films were in it? yeah, same. Where, where you had the mafia dudes. I think it was called Cinco or Kinko or some shit like that, or CC or some shit like that. She bought that with the house attached to it, and it was like a Mexican-run thing, and they they turned into a comedy club. Yo, Mitzi Shore, if I'm being honest, if I think about it, see, the way we put acts on on stage, so you put an act on, you put an act on, you put an act on, that could only happen if you have a following. You're not going to put a fucking random person on stage, maybe with an open mic, but that's a subject of the night. If your subject of the night is just comedians, 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 it doesn't matter if they have a following. They're there to get one. Just like the Beatles created having a hook 
and having 16 bars, they created they created the structure of the Beatles. Most people don't know that. But they created the true structure. Yes, there was blues music and jazz music and all, but they created the true structure where people are like, oh, there's a hook that comes here. Oh, there's a verse that comes here. Mitzi created the place for comedians to flex. She put them back to back to back to back in a fucking lineup. Let's see what happens. Imagine going up after somebody just killed it. I know what that feels like. You know how many times I've had to go up on stage after somebody just fucking annihilated it? Yo, this dude plays guitar, sings with his dick, plays with his girl's pussy, and he can do a backflip all in one performance. Now I go next. You heard me? Now I go next. You know how many times I've been there? You know how many times I've been there where that last act was fucking killer? You know what it made me do, though? It made me become a killer. It may, I had to. In that moment, I can't let that get the best of me. I am, a, I am a competitor just like him, and he is my competition. How the fuck did this woman know that that would be the right remedy to now to this day? Comedians will say, if you didn't perform at the comedy club, you ain't perform. That's crazy. There was separate rooms there. That's crazy. Yo, to see the lineup in that documentary on any given night, it'd be a lineup of fucking Tom Segura, fucking Joe Rogan. Uh, it, yo, Dave Chappelle. Yo, just see the lineup. Imagine seeing a lineup like that and you only pay like $30 to get in. I don't give a fuck if they working out their material. That's phenomenal. And it turned me different for... It, it made me different... I didn't realize how much I was I was a different fan of hip hop until I saw that. I I used to be very bad. I used to go into spots and like and try to t intimidate other artists that would perform and look them down. I would even start a, start a riot. Yo, let's battle. Let's fight. You gonna have no balls? You gonna do mad arrogant, dragging my balls on the floor? To... Yes, you should be conceded to a certain extent, but. You get humbled when that fucking guy that's 125 pounds just put you in submission. She created that. She created a place of destructiveness, of humbleness. She gave all these artists a place to give their voice. We don't have that no more. Back in the days, they used to have the tunnel. And i never been to the tunnel. I'm, I'm too young for the tunnel. But the stories that I got, it was a place to, for you to bring your niggas. Like... You know the variety level. You was in the tunnel. People, you you, you in the tunnel. You, you in the tunnel for a reason. You know the variety. Yo, we don't got that. We don't got that. What? But, but, I mean, if you're famous already, maybe. If you're famous already, yeah. There's certain spots you could go to. Everybody says it on Nubu. You know, everybody says it on tracks. Fine. But what if you're not famous? What if you're trying to get famous? What if you want to flex? Now this corona shit got it to the point where I guarantee promoters don't even want to do open mics. Promoters don't want no... What? Charge you 20 bucks at the door? Charge you 20 bucks to perform? All right. You get 40 bucks off of you, maybe if you pay it? No. Promoters make money off the people that come to see you. The people that come to see you buy drinks at the bar. The people that come to see... The, the promoters make money off of you when you're a guaranteed act. Yo, bro, unless you're a guaranteed act, you're not. And we are living in this fucking weird-ass time where people that aren't guaranteed, we have to create a lane now. We have to create a lane and make people believe in us. And now we can't even perform to get new fans. We just... Yo, what she created when I saw this documentary was perfect timing. It came out during COVID, yes, but it was perfect timing because... All these people that got famous, the acknowledgement that they gave to her, yo, this it brought me back to my our, our Yippie days, like my Yippie days. Like Yippie was that place. Every Thursday was an open mic. Five dollars to perform or five dollars to get in. You sign your name up on the list. The talent that was in that building, for us to always get the eligibility to flex our muscle, yo, I, I'm so grateful. You know, I'm grateful for you promoters that have given us that time. For your open mics, for your showcases. Yeah, we got to do work. We got to hit you up. Maybe we got to bring five or ten people. 
But for the ones that we don't have to bring any people, and you still give us the eligibility, not paying a grip a slot, because I know, like, when you're an artist, yeah, you pay your... These comedians were performing for free. Mitty Shore gave a place for comedians to perform for free. You just have to have your name on the list. And then you might even get to be a paid regular, which is $15 a night. So you times that by five. Was it $75 in a week? You make $75 just for stepping on stage, talking your shit, and walking off. How many of you rappers, how many of you singers, how many of you artists get paid every time you perform? On the underground circuit, not many of us. So what she offered to fucking artists and to people was fucking unimaginable. She gave us a place to flex. Now we are absent of that. She gave you a place to be better. Now we're absent of that. So to see her, I have to I have to give her my hat. I wish I could have met Mitzi. I wish, um, I hope one day that, yeah, uh, I aspire to be a comedian. I hope one day that I get to the comedy store so I can be with that club. Just like I'm with the club of the SOB people that perform. Just like I'm with the club of the pyramid people that perform. Just like I'm with the club of the camarada people that perform. Just like I'm with the club of the West End people that perform. Just like I'm with the club of Black Thorn people that perform. Yo, I want to be a part of these clubs. Because as an artist, regardless if I podcast, I make music, or I'm just a personality, I'm still an artist that loves art. I love the art of it. She gave people a place to love their art. Be part of their art. And show off their art. So this documentary really resonated with me to the point where it inspires me. I want to give a place for people to do that. I don't, I, I don't bar, I, I, not specifically, just come perform. I want to have a place where people can just come perform, enjoy themselves. It's a constant thing. Come perform, enjoy yourself, flex your muscle. That good, not that good, don't matter. Here. You got a slot. You waited in line. You deserve it. You earned it. Here. Come on. Like, this is, um, for me, this is just another fruit. It's just a fruit from the hanging tree, bro. Like, I know I say it's a hanging fruit, but no, it's a fruit from a hanging tree. That tree is bent. Just grab it. Eat that fruit. This is what you needed. That's why I love that documentary. That's why that documentary really hit me home. Because this is what... We need now, more than ever, more than ever, artists, we need a place to come together, to congregate. Shout out to Gorilla Grooves. Gorilla Grooves gave us a place for that, where we can come together, conjugate all the time. You know, like every Tuesday, you'd be able to go there, 15, 20 people, all with different arts, just to chill. He probably still has it available, but it, it that shit like that. We need more of those sanctuaries, those monasteries, those places where artists can be and be comfortable and flex their shit and get better. Because if not, we're never really going to get better. You need a crowd to get better. You need you need people around you to get better. She knew that. She knew that if you put a whole bunch of people in the seats or if you just give an open door to people to come see other people, it's going to happen. That's a belief. That's amazing. So Mitzi, rest in peace. All my love. One day I'll have a picture of you in my fucking place because I know how much you meant to all these people. Or one day I'll have a picture of myself or somebody that really carries this tide of bringing all these artists together and without a selfish agenda. Yo, a matter of fact, I'm going to leave you with this. Arsenio Hall interviewed her and asked her while she was like on a, uh, I think it was like a red carpet or something like that. Like, yo, you created Robin Williams, Jim Carrey, blah, 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 blah. Yo, Mitzi, how you feel about this? And she looks at Arsenio Hall and dead in his eyes. And all right on camera, she goes, oh, Arsenio, don't ask me things like that. The humbleness of that woman. Yeah, I made all these people. I gave all these people eligibility to be great, but they made themselves great. The permission. Yo, I'm out of here, y'all. It's your boy, okay? Everything is okay. Stop your shit.